Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is going to be introduced by Jerry Tetro, the person who gave a very fine talk on the, uh, in the earlier session that we had, and I'm asking him to introduce uh, the next speaker because he has worked closely with him for a long time on the subject of urban renewal. Mr. Tetro. The fellow I'd like to introduce uh, needs none, no introduction from me, really, and since the time is getting short, I should be brief, but I'll say this. Before anybody started kicking a fuss about urban renewal in Boston, this guy was running around trying to get support from people who wouldn't even listen to him. Now, years later, people are finally waking up to the fact that there is an urban renewal problem in Boston, that people are losing their homes. This man was dedicated from the very beginning. He knows city planning, he knows architecture, he knows the mentality behind urban renewal. We at the North Harvard area have worked with him very, very closely. He has been most helpful. He has, in fact, initiated most of the anti-urban renewal forces in the city of Boston. I'd like to give you now John Howard. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm scheduled to speak here this morning on two subjects. The first one being, urban renewal destroys our form of government. So it'd be well to reflect for a moment on just what is our form of government. We know that it is a constitutional republic, which means that the supreme power resides in the people through their elected representatives who in turn are responsible to the people. How does urban renewal therefore destroy this, our form of government? It does it by first instituting a program which is not being given the consent of the people. Let us take, for example, our own case here in Massachusetts and in the city of Boston, where under GL 121, the homes and businesses of people may be taken by the power of eminent domain. This law, GL 121, was passed by the state legislature without the consent of the people. The Boston Redevelopment Authority in this particular city was formed without the consent of the people. powers of the Redevelopment Authority, as they are given to it under GL 121, are fantastic. The authority can, within its operation, acquire the property of any and every, any, by any and every means, by gift, grant, devise, eminent domain, or otherwise. It can hold the property or sell it or trade, assign, lease, subdivide, or transfer both real and personal property. The authority can enter into contracts, covenants, restrictions, and the use of property in the project area as to residential, commercial, industrial, and recreational. It can issue bonds, borrow money, invest funds, pay insurance premiums. It can apply for loans, grants, or contributions from either private or public sources from the city, county, state, or federal government. It will act as the absolute arm of the ju judiciary in acquiring into the use of the property. The authority may or may not sell to a redeveloper after all the land has been cleared of buildings and obstructions. It may also lease or exchange it. The sale price can be less than the purchase price. Two thirds of the loss will be paid by the federal government, actually all of it, because the city, re re the city receives credit on its one-third for any public buildings such as schools or libraries erected on the cleared land or by its use for parks, playgrounds, and the like. The authority can advertise for contractors that can dispose of any real property without notice to anyone. At the discretion of the authority, it can convey property for streets, right-of-way, sewers, and for parks, schools, and public buildings. It can close streets and move public utilities. 
No member of the authority shall be held liable for the bonds issued by the authority. The property held by the authority will be tax-free, but an amount in lieu of taxes shall be paid. When the property is sold to a redeveloper, it shall be returned to the tax rolls. When it is leased to the redeveloper, the property is not returned to be taxed. I'll give you some idea of the power of the redevelopment authorities in this country. Power given without consent of the people. We have some idea of how close we have come to an era of tyranny in our day, because after all, our form of constitutional government was devised to ensure freedom. The men who wrote the Constitution knew from bitter experience what it was to lose freedom. And freedom consists largely in the rights of ownership of property, the right to acquire, to own, to use and to dispose of property in freedom is the very basis of freedom. The Declaration of Independence gave us life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness. It was later changed to pursuit of happiness. But a person cannot enjoy life, he cannot enjoy liberty, without property. Take as a theoretical case that you were denied any and all types of property. You could not even own, let us say, the clothes on your back. How long would you live? You would have no protection from the elements. You would have no means of exchange. You would, you would not even have the dignity of the animals in the field. The freedom of a human being demands that he have the freedom to use and to dispose of property. And this is the central theme that must be kept in mind when we're speaking of our form of government. Why our form of government? To ensure freedom. Here we have a program which strikes the very heart of freedom, for it can take from man the basis by which life and liberty are sustained. It's like a tripod. Take away the right of property, you cannot have life and liberty. Urban renewal destroys our form of government by corrupting almost every institution that a free society enjoys and must depend upon as its bulwarks. It corrupts our local politicians, for when there is land that can be taken by the power of eminent domain, corruption is bound to creep in, and this has been proven time after time in states throughout the country. The urban renewal program in a big city cannot get underway without the support of many of the very large business interests in that city. So that again, leaders, many of the leaders in our business society who should be the champions of liberty again become corrupted by the uh, uh, rewards which are held out to them under the urban renewal program. Urban renewal destroys our form of government by corrupting a free press. You cannot have freedom prevail for any length of time if you do not have a free press dedicated to supporting freedom. And yet no urban renewal program in any large city can get underway unless it is first won the support of the press, by which the people must be brainwashed into accepting it as the panacea for all of our civic guilds. 
Urban renewal destroys our form of government by denying to the people the right to vote on the urban renewal program itself. We have this case here in Charlestown where the legislature denied them a referendum. <laughs> urban renewal destroys our form of government by substituting for our regularly elected bodies neighborhood groups who purport to speak for the property rights of all people of a district. This is a point I would like to spend a few minutes on, if I may. These neighborhood groups, in most cases you will find, are actually the mouthpiece of the Urban Renewal Authority. They are the Trojan horse, which is sent into an area to brainwash the people. Now, the authority in setting up these mouthpieces tell the press after their same neighborhood group applauds the urban renewal program, tells the press that the people of the district want urban renewal. In other words, you take a district that may have, say, 3,000 people, here you have a, a small neighborhood group composed of perhaps two, 300 people with the, even a, a much smaller uh, cadre directing the whole thing. And <laughs> here's the urban renewal authority telling the press that the people want urban renewal, and actually it's the authority itself telling the press that the people want urban renewal, not the people themselves. It's a, a rather clever device that has been used, and used very effectively. So that here we have a case of citizen A telling the government that it is all right for the government to take the property of citizen B and C. And citizen, uh, all of the citizens in, in that particular area uh, deny a due process of law, because a due process of law means that a person may, con may contest the taking of his land in a court or courts of law. This is all bypassed, and the authority just listens to its own little group stand up and say, we want urban renewal. Not only this, but these particular neighborhood groups that I have in mind have the power to shut off any opposition because the members of uh, or the leaders of the group will treat those who are uh, for urban renewal as favored sons and those who are opposed, they can interrupt their pre the presentation of their views by well-timed interruptions and by calling them out of order. They hold the gavel and they usually control things very well in their own favor. That is why you have experienced the upheaval which we had uh, quite a while ago in North Harvard Street in Alston and recently in Charlestown because illegality and lack of fairness breed illegality and lack of fairness. Mob rule, and here we have mob rule. I had an experience out in the, out in the uh, uh, Roxbury area where the well-placed barkers in the audience could shut off anybody. Here we have mob rule. Mob rule, no matter how it is instituted, no matter how they try to dress it up, so long as the individual is being denied his right, so long as, that it runs, so long as the process runs counter to our regular democratic process as we know it through our duly elected officials, this type of mob rule will in turn inspire mob rule to combat it. And we have seen this in the case of Charlestown. So I think there are many other points I could, could go into, but I know our time is short and I will stop at this point. But here I think you have enough to reflect upon and, and understand why urban renewal does in fact tend to destroy our form of government. Thank you. John Howard, thank you very much. You cut your, short, your talk short because we uh, 
have to make up for lost time here. The uh, next speaker that we're going to have is um, a professor at Boston College. Some uh, 18 months, two years ago anyway, I had a chance to chat with him. Uh, I had a chance to chat with him after one of the conservative gatherings at uh, Boston College. And from what I remember there, we're going to have a very interesting talk. And I will now introduce the speaker whose subject is urban, urban renewal uh, usurps the power of God. Is it possible to believe in God and also in urban renewal? Dr. Vincent A. McCrossan. Mr. Robertson and other friends of freedom, one of the most interesting characteristics of God is his stress on individuality. This is his mark throughout all his universe. God revels in creating individuals, he upon whom there are no limits apparently places a limit upon himself. His infinite imagination is apparently bored by repetition. He refuses to repeat himself in creation. He makes only individuals, each distinct, unique with its own oneness, shared by absolutely none of its equals in all his expanding cosmos. Throughout all time, there is just one physiognomy exactly like yours or mine. No one will ever look exactly like us. No one will ever sound exactly like us. Each of us has had the experience of answering a telephone call from thousands of miles away, and before the speaker identified himself, we knew who was speaking. Commonplacely, we say, I recognized your voice. We recognize voices because they are unique individual. Our vocal cords in their relaxing and their tautening, in their thickness and their thinness, are like no other vocal cords in all unending time. Our faces, our hands, our eyes, our speech, our touch, are ours and ours alone, because God, who could do everything differently, is by his nature anti-totalitarian. He creates only the individual and he creates only out of love. Even at the lowest levels of his creation, his mark is just as characteristically the non-totalitarian mark of individualism. No tiniest cell is the exact replica of any other cell. God revels in stressing individuality everywhere in his creation. Since the 18th century, particularly in its roots of the French Revolution, the totalitarian cry against God and his attributes rises an ever-mounting crescendo. There is no father of modern totalitarianism, not even Marx himself, as important as the 18th century French pervert Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau sounds clearly the cleavage that rends men of freedom from men of bondage, and Rousseau inevitably on the side of bondage sounds the clarion call of totalitarian liberalism which is the clarion call of urban renewal. Quote, when the first man said, this is mine, evil began in the world. While property existed only for community use, there was no evil. We must therefore deny to the individual the private use of what is his. It is, the for, it is for the community to take from the individual his own and appropriate it to group use, end quote. The distance from Rousseau to Nazism is thus minimal. Basic Nazi slogans were, Gemeinnutz, gate for Eigennutz. The good of the community takes precedence over the good of the individual. Ewiger Trotz, allen Reaktionären, eternal defiance to all reactionaries. Tägliche Fortschritte in die Zukunft, daily forward steps into the future. Had Hitler been living in Boston, he would seemingly have worded it, forward with Edward Loeb and Monsignor Lally.
Now here in a nutshell, you have outlined the conflict of our time. The conflict between the world of God, the world in which the individual is God's abiding and persistent and universal creation, and the world which rises against God, denies his attributes, attacks God's universal creation, the individual, and usurps and warps his laws. The world of totalitarianism, which stresses the might and power of government, and therefore inevitably stresses the littleness of man. For big government inevitably means little man, little in all his rights, including, of course, little in ownership. Now it is easy in dozens of ways to prove Rousseau, the father of modern totalitarian liberalism, was wrong. For original sin is not rooted in property. It is rooted in disobedience and pride. The same type of pride that would usurp and arrogate to itself the decision to take a man's property from him and give it to others in the name of community betterment. The wrongness of the Rousseauan liberal viewpoint on property is also well delineated by the fact that one-fifth of God's commandments have to do with private property. It is interesting that God took time out to give to Moses two binding negatives against meddling with others' property. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Any Charleston resident with his property threatened by urban renewal knows full well that the action against his ownership is theft. It is thieving to allow $6,000 for a property that on a free market brings 15000 it is a theft. It is a theft of nine thousand dollars, which can easily represent the entire life saving of a man and his wife. Savings painfully put together out of sacrifice and out of self denial. It is theft to allow six thousand dollars for a property that cannot be replaced for fifteen thousand. Any sum allowed short of replacement value is theft. And theft is forbidden by one of God's commandments. Pope Leo XIII, on May 15, 1891, in Rerum Novarum, for our modern age, continues the emphasis of God's commandment. Quote, Property rights must be religiously respected, and it is the duty of the public authority to prevent and punish injury and to protect everyone in the possession of his own. It should ever be borne in, born in mind that the chief thing to be realized is the safeguarding of private property by legal enactment and public policy. Neither justice nor the common good allows any individual to seize that which belongs to another, or under the futile and shallow pretext of equality, to lay violent hands on other people's possessions. End quote from Pius XIII. And it is a more subtle and quite possibly a more deadly theft still to tell a man his property is blighted and it should be taken from him and given to another, a group of bankers or developers who can renew it for the community. What pride there is in this modern liberal totalitarian Boston, the pride of Rousseau, the pride of Satan, the pride of the revolt against God, my roots, thank God, are not in Massachusetts. They are in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And as I see the contemporary debauch of Boston in urban renewal, I am a bit impressed that the ancient adage, Montani semper liberi, mountaineers always free, has a great deal of truth. <laughs> Sixteen years ago this fall, I came to Boston. I came to love your old streets, your hallowed bricks, the green-gray lichen on your trees and rocks and homes. In my Pennsylvania boyhood days, I thrilled to the stories of the freedom of my country rooted here, stories of Revere, of Bunker Hill, of Charlestown, of brave farmers of Lexington and Concord who dared to face death for freedom's flame. But I found, alas, that 
in these days, these things mean nothing to the men of power in your city and in your suburbs. They are ruthless, totalitarian men of pride. They tear down beauty and history and culture and call it blight, and erect in its stead soulless, characterless, modern, liberal, totalitarian buildings with the soul of America erased, buildings such as one can find only too universally behind the Iron Curtain in Tashkent and Odessa and Kiev and Moscow. And modern Lexington and Concord are a craven, hypocritical, totalitarian insult to the creativity and individualism and Americanism which once animated them. People of Boston, this urban renewal, totalitarian denial of the rights of individual ownership and self-determination of property are the mark of your decline, the mark of decline of America. In vain did Paul Revere hang his lanterns to shine on Charlestown. The men of Lexington and Concord died in vain. This urban renewal is the triumph of ancient tyranny, of power-bloated men against God's little, humble creatures. The greatest poet that ever sat foot in Boston, the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, who loves so much your old Boston streets, now threatened by urban renewal, puts into the mouth of Christ a cry that I think well catches the spirit of anguish of God's little ones against the powers that now crush them, or in Washington, as so well delineated by Mrs. Barron in the tale of Mark and Anne. You are a quote, you are oppressed, and those who have oppressed you are the children of palaces and of marketplaces, great of wealth, but little of soul. The feet that have trodden upon you have not destroyed the fragrancy that ascends toward heaven with a good man, with a good woman's love, with the widow's lament, the orphan's cry, and the poor man's sigh. All the fragrance from the incense of exiles rises to the fount of justice and mercy. Take comfort in that you are the flower crushed and not the foot that crushed it." End quote. And from the great poet of Irish freedom, Patrick Pierce, I think we have a word of warning to the foot that has crushed, of warning to the power of urban renewal, the prideful power of tyrannical men. Quote, my heart has been heavy with the grief of mothers. My eyes have been wet with the tears of children. I have yearned with old wistful men and laughed or cursed with young men. Their shame is my shame, and I have reddened for it, reddened for that they have gone in want, reddened for that they have walked in fear of lawyers with their writs of summons, mean men, men mean and cruel. I say to my people that they are holy, that they are greater than those who hold them and stronger and purer that they have but need of courage and to call on the name of their God, God the unforgetting, the dear God that loves the peoples for whom he died naked, suffering shame. And I say to my people's masters, beware, beware of the thing that is coming, beware of the risen people. We will try it out with you, ye that have harried and held, Ye that have bullied and bribed tyrants, hypocrites, liars. End quote. I think indeed that when men usurp the power of God, they do indeed need beware.
ladies and gentlemen, we've had a stirring message there, which I think we can carry in our hearts for some time. Thank you very much, Dr. McCrossan. Uh, we have, we're supposed to be into our question period, but uh, John Howard has a, a short few remarks to make on the second part of his program. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to him now on urban renewal is unconstitutional. And I say, hear, hear. John Howard. Thank you again. I'm going to start off the second part of my talk here with a quotation from the 1917 edition of Modern American Law, I have quoted this time and time again in talks, and I think it's one of the best quotations that a person can make, so that you who are in the audience heard me before, bear with me. Quotation, the 1917 edition of Modern American Law issued by the Blackstone Institute and once the Bible of constitutional authorities. Quotation, it may be laid down as a fundamental rule that it is not of the proper function of a constitutional government to directly assist private enterprise. Under ordinary conditions, the power of eminent domain cannot be constitutionally employed to enable private individuals to carry on their business or to cultivate their land to better advantage, even if the prosperity of the community will be enhanced by their success. The establishment of a large factory furnishing employment for hundreds of hands might be of the greatest material benefit to a community, but it is well understood that even if the only available site is owned by one who capriciously refuses to part with it at any price, the power of eminent domain cannot be invoked to overcome his objections. How much less, then, is the right to eject property owners in favor of, say, a ballpark or a privately built housing project? That, I think, would take care of the argument which is constantly given to us that because we take, say, the North Harvard Street area of six, seven acres the tax return will in time be tripled. In other words, the government in this case has made you simply an economic pawn. It means that your right to own and to hold property is dependent upon the tax yield from that property. And that the government can have you relinquish those rights if it, the government, thinks the tax return is not high enough. You have become mere chattel in the hands of the government. You have become an economic pawn. You have become a debased human being. You have become, in other words, a slave of the government. This certainly is unconstitutional. We're concerned, however, not with the, the uh, the theoretical aspect of it at this point. We have any number of uh, cases to point to where you are, in fact, guaranteed by the letter of the law. In Article 4 of the Bill of Rights, every citizen is guaranteed the right to be secure in his, in his person, houses, house, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Article 5 provides that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Due process of law does not consist in a mob standing up in a public hearing called by the authority yelling, give us urban renewal, and a few months later having the sheriff knocking on your door telling you to pack your stuff and get out. This is not due process of law. This is tyranny. Urban renewal was made possible by a decision 
In 1954, by the Supreme Court, in the case of Berman versus Parker. And it was decided by this famous Supreme Court, by the judge who has, at the present time to his record, I believe three wives, who about three years ago, in addressing students of a particular college, called for the recognition of Red China. This same judge gave the decision in the Berman versus Parker case and said that the government does have the right to determine whether or not your neighborhood is well balanced and that if the government decides that it is not well balanced, the government may take your property and destroy it. This, in effect, is what he said. This justice, in delivering the decision of the court, decided that the Congress of the United States, for as we know, the Congress is like the state, the Congress of the United States is like the state legislature in the District of Columbia, it would be like our own present legislature here, that the Congress of the United States, in determining what was best for the District of Columbia, had the right thereby to determine the means by which its, its uh, goals should be carried out. In other words, the end justifies the means. And that if trying to make the District of Columbia more beautiful meant taking the land away from one private citizen and selling or leasing it to another, then this was the right of the Congress. For as the court said, once the object has been determined by Congress, it is up to Congress and Congress alone to determine how the objective should be accomplished. This is dictatorship, and certainly unconstitutional. It is interesting to note that before this particular case, Berman versus Parker, came before the Supreme Court, that the lower court in the District of Columbia decided that urban renewal was, in fact, unconstitutional, that the owner's right to hold and own property was superior to any claim that the government may have upon that property. But we do not need to even read the Bill of Rights, or to read the Berman versus Parker case, or to read the quotation that I have given you here from the 1917 edition of Modern American Law, we do not need anybody to tell us that what belongs to us no man has the right to seize. <laughs> the people have be become so confused by the multitude of false leaders who have come to help them in their distress, that they are month by month losing sight of the most fundamental issue that is involved in urban renewal. No matter how they dress it up, no matter what kind of plans they may come forward with, no matter who is doing the renewing, be it the federal government, the state government, the city government, our local citizens banded together to beautify an area, so long as any of these plans involve the seizure of a single individual's property so that it may be sold or leased to another private individual, the plan remains immoral and tyrannical. So that in the end, it is useless to go into long treatises on how urban renewal does not in fact raise the tax rate, why urban renewal does not in fact eradicate delin delinquency and slums, why urban renewal is financially unwise. These things are actually asides. 
The only real matter to be kept in mind is that urban renewal is intrinsically evil because it is a form of legalized theft. Thank you.